Hi everyone, for those joining us right away, we're going to start shortly. Give us just about a minute and we'll get started as people trickle in. Give it about a few more seconds. All right, a couple more seconds. A couple more people are joining us. All right, let's get started. Thank you for zooming in with us today. Welcome back to Thirsty Thursday with Barristan Law. We hope you brought a bevy of choice and all the questions that have been crossing your mind for the lawyers to tackle. On behalf of the Sandbox Center team, we're super excited to have our sponsors Barristan Law back today. And with us, we have Chris Holmes and Justin Vanden Ende to have a conversation around force majeure clauses as it relates to the current climate of COVID-19, contractual obligations, and any other questions just in general that you may have. So for those who haven't been acquainted with me or the Sandbox, I'm Mackenzie. I head up marketing and public relations. I'm one of the five members. And we're located downtown Barrie for those who haven't visited us before. I know Chris and Justin have. And we connect people and their ideas to business resources on their journey to success. So before we get started, just wanted to remind the attendees of a couple quick Zoom tips. You are muted as you come into the room. Uh, we will be taking questions throughout, so we encourage you to use the Q&A feature that's at the bottom of your screen and not the chat, just so we can keep things organized. Um, so whenever you have a question pop in your head, feel free to use that chat feature, and the guys will be facilitating the questions as they come in. The resources will also be provided uh, afterwards after this webinar is finished. So just a couple massive thank yous to all of our community partners for supporting with the sharing of our events. And of course, a big thank you to our sponsors, Barristan Law, for del delivering today's session. So I'll hand it over now to Justin and Chris to tell us a little bit about themselves and start us off. Okay, I'll go first. My name's Chris Holmes. I'm an associate lawyer here at Barristan. I practice in corporate law, wills, and real estate. So I'm here today to talk to you guys once Justin's gone through you know, what force majeure is and, and how it, it really impacts people, especially given COVID-19. I'll go and talk to you guys about how you can deal with your contracts moving forward and how to incorporate this, a better force majeure clause into your contracts to make sure the next time, hopefully you know, another COVID-19 doesn't happen anytime soon, but the next time something comes that limits you from being able to perform in your contracts, you're protected as best you can be. Hey everybody, my name is Justin Vandenendi. I'm a lawyer with Barristan Law. I work in uh, Collingwood as well as Barry. Um, I'm a litigator with Barristan, which means essentially I sue people or businesses or I defend lawsuits. So I'm gonna be talking about um, <clears throat> force majeure clauses uh, I'll give a brief overview of, of what they are, um, as well as compare them to another doctrine of contract law called frustration. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be talking about this in the context, of course, of coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, and, and what COVID-19 has essentially done to many businesses in, in our communities um, has pre prevented um, the buy side of a contract um, from performing. Uh, perhaps uh, there's an agreement to uh, purchase um, supplies on an ongoing basis from a supplier. Um, perhaps it's a long-term commercial lease and the devastation of, of that um, person's business or that company uh, has prevented them from fulfilling their obligations uh, for that ongoing supply or perhaps prevented them from paying rent. So what is a force majeure clause? We'll begin with that and, and, um, and what does it do? So 
a force majeure clause, essentially, the effect of it is to suspend um, the obligation to perform under a contract. Um, so it can take many different um, forms, depending on, on what type of contract we're talking about. But realistically, what it does is suspend you. Uh, it allows you to, to not perform. It allows you to not do what you are required to do under the contract. And um, essentially, uh, your ability to utilize a force, force majeure clause uh, entirely depends on the language of the clause. And what I'm going to attempt to do here is clarify the difference between force majeure and frustration of contract. So force majeure does not exist outside of um, the written contractual terms uh, between two parties. It um, must be uh, agreed upon between two or more parties. Uh, for example, if I have a contract to purchase 100 widgets every month for $10, and those are the only terms, um, I cannot rely on force majeure. Force majeure does not just exist um, as part of the common law, um, there needs to be a term. So there needs to be a term in my contract to purchase the widgets that says, for example, if some sort of unforeseeable event, such as a war or a pandemic, um, were to occur, at that point, I can suspend my um, obligation to perform and I can no longer, and I can choose, okay, I'm taking advantage of the force majeure clause and I'm no longer going to purchase uh, the widgets next month. And of course, I'm, I'm greatly simplifying these things, but I'm attempting to just lay the groundwork here. So, and again, like many of the force majeure clauses will have very specific obligations on one party or the other before, um, uh, the term can be taken advantage of and it all it all goes back to the contractual language For example, sometimes there's notice requirements if a party wants to take advantage of a force majeure clause oftentimes the clause will say um, You need to provide us with 60 days notice before um, taking advantage of uh, the force majeure um, That's just an example of, of how it might be limited um, another example is, um, you know, perhaps the, the clause says, uh, okay, force majeure is applicable if a war occurs, right? Um, and if, if war isn't really defined, then obviously a war in the Middle East um, um, would not apply, uh, most likely, if, if you're talking about a contract in Ontario. Um, so let me just take a, I'm, I'm seeing a couple questions here. So let me just read through these questions and see if I can uh, answer them quickly. Okay, so this is a question about employment law. I'm gonna skip that one for now. I might be able to come back to it, Susan. Um, okay, if we have a contract that does not include a force majeure clause, should I redo the contract? Um, we will get back, we will get to this, to this uh, question at the end. So let me just continue on um, describing force majeure. Um, typically, uh, force majeure allows for a temporary suspension of uh, contractual performance. So if, for example, your, your force majeure clause allowed for um, a pandemic to suspend performance, then oftentimes, it needs to be reassessed on an ongoing basis uh, to determine if um, performance can uh, restart at some point. Obviously, um, it's still a little unclear uh, how long COVID-19 is going to be uh, affecting us, but it's clearly gonna be a long-term um, um, factor here. Um, the federal government is talking about a multi-year or multiple year long uh, time horizon. So, um, if a force majeure contract uh, or clause specifies um, 
a date for it to be reassessed, then the parties would do so on an ongoing basis. And the final thing I'll say about force majeure clauses um, before com comparing it to frustration is that they are interpreted very strictly by the courts. Um, what that means is the courts will say, we have two commercial parties here. Both are very uh, knowledgeable and they have the resources to, to negotiate what they want to negotiate. And they will uphold the terms um, strictly and narrowly. So they're going to um, read the words and give, uh, give meaning to the words exactly as you put them in the contract, essentially. So for example, if the force majeure clause um, does not specifically list pandemic, um, it's not going to be able to be used by the parties. If it does not list pandemic, um, you would not be able to uh, take advantage of the force majeure clause. So to answer this question that's been posted in the chat, um, should you redo a contract that doesn't include force majeure? Um, well, you certainly could attempt to negotiate with the opposing party. Um, you could certainly attempt to negotiate and, and put it in, but at this point, a, a party is going to demand performance. They're going to demand that you continue on with your obligations if the force majeure clause, um, or if there, sorry, if there is no force majeure clause, then they're going to continue to, um, um, demand performance. So we've had another comment here from Kate. Thank you, Kate. Um, like I said, force majeure clauses are interpreted strictly. And in my opinion, if a force majeure clause um, were, if it did not include um, a term that suggests a pandemic, like specifically a pandemic allows a party to suspend performance of their obligations. So by that, I mean, stop buying widgets every month. If it does not um, say a pandemic, it will not be able to be used in the context of COVID-19. So that's a good segue now into my conversation about frustration of contract. So like I said, force majeure does not exist if it's not written down. If it's not um, set out as a term or a clause in a contract, force majeure does not exist. However, frustration of contract does exist. Frustration of contract is what's called a common law doctrine. And essentially it exists to ensure that in certain situations, the court can still come to a just and fair resolution of a dispute. And frustration of contract is very similar to force majeure in that um, it comes into play when performance of the contract becomes essentially impossible. So in force majeure, the party set out a bunch of um, circumstances in which they agree uh, they will no longer re require performance. Whereas in frustration, it, there, some sort of unforeseen circumstance needs to occur. And after it does occur, if it makes performance of the contract impossible, then the court will say this contract is frustrated and it would allow the parties to walk away with no obligation to each other. Um, obviously, uh, this is a very difficult standard to meet. Um, and the, the reason for that is essentially just freedom of contract, right? Um, we allow people to, to specify terms in their contract how they wish. And for the court to intervene and, and simply essentially insert a, a contractual clause requires um, extreme circumstances. So um, it needs to, it, it can't be simply a level of hardship. For example, you know, this thing has been very difficult. The COVID situation has been very hard on restaurants, right? Um, I'm sure uh, revenues have absolutely cratered. So that is not, unfortunately, is not to a level of impossibility of performance, right? So if you as a restaurant had a, had a contract to purchase uh, tomatoes on an ongoing basis, right? Um, that party could theoretically 
demand performance because on their end of the thing, on, on their end of the contract, you know, they, they contracted to sell you tomatoes on an ongoing basis. And technically you can still offer takeout from your restaurant and from the perspective of the tomato farmer, it's not his problem that um, you're not able to sell the tomatoes because you agreed to buy tomatoes from him. And so it's a very, very difficult standard to meet um, this, the standard of impossible. Um, and of course there is a bit of gray area and that's what we litigators make a lot of money doing is arguing about the gray area. And um, essentially, you know, one, one of the, I was trying to think of scenarios where potentially I could argue a contract was frustrated. And, and one thing that came to my mind was uh, a movie theater who, or the movie theater contracts, a commercial lease, right? And part of the commercial lease, the term is um, that the, the, the lessor, the movie theater, they must operate a movie theater in the building, right? So it's arguable that because of COVID-19, it has become impossible to operate a movie theater. Um, now, of course, the other side could argue, well, hey, you could still show movies to two people, right? Or something along those lines. Um, and that, that would be the, the opposite ar argument. But I think that you'd have a, a certainly, depending on the terms of the lease and, and so on and so forth, you'd at, at, at the very least, you'd have a good argument that it's been in, become impossible to operate a movie theater and during COVID-19. Um, the other issue with that is to argue frustration of contract, there needs to be a relatively permanent um, change in the circumstances um, that the parties didn't really foresee when they were agreeing to the contract. And so currently, it's not clear to us how permanent um, COVID-19 might change our society. There's a lot of talk about vaccines um, and whether or not um, we're gonna be able to develop one, but uh, potentially it could have long lasting effects that a court would consider to be a permanent change. Um, <clears throat> the, the other aspect of frustration of contract, which I, I may have I missed at the beginning is that it needs to be an unforeseeable um, circumstance that um, creates the, the impossibility of performance. Um, I would argue in general, like COVID-19 is unforeseeable, um, the, at least the, the, the far reaching effects of it. Of course, we've had pandemics, but uh, a pandemic that caused this much um, economic disruption, uh, you might have to go back to the Spanish flu to find something similar. And um, to, to, it's not likely that parties when they're making contracts were considering the Spanish flu when they were making those contracts. So um, it, it, it would likely be found that COVID-19 is an unforeseeable event. Um, the question for the court would then become, has performance become impossible? So to try to wrap this up, the difference here, frustration is likely to be, uh, you know, if you have existing contracts, um, the vast majority, I, I would say in general, of small business contracts do not include force majeure clauses. Maybe Chris has a different opinion. He actually drafts those things, so he would have a better idea. I just litigate them. But um, generally, um, uncomplicated transactions don't require force majeure clauses simply because the, the amount of time that they would be enforceable uh, is very rare, right? Um, for a war or some other natural disaster, uh, to occur or this pandemic, right, um, is perhaps once in a century type of event. Uh, so in, an, in any event, frustration of contract, what it can do for you is uh, potentially give you a bargaining chip. Um, it, it's not exactly a free pass, right? And, and every situation depends on the facts. Every situation is different. Um, but um, frustration um, may provide, give you a bargaining uh, uh, chip uh, 
in the in the negotiation of an ongoing contract. We've got one more question here, Kim Saunders. Thank you, Kim. In frustration of contract, is an employer still obligated to pay out notice and severance? Another employment uh, question here. It's a very um, difficult time for employers and employees right now, and um, we do want to help out. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me think about this. No, I would argue, well, well, yes. I mean, in general, the answer is uh, yes. Frustration could um, uh, prevent an employer from, from paying your uh, notice, but not during COVID. COVID-19 would not constitute um, frustration of contract for uh, an employment contract. Uh, I could say that. Like, I mean, of course, again, I don't want to make um, blanket statements. There are situations that where that could occur, uh, but in general, COVID-19 is not going to prevent an employer from being obligated to pay uh, notice or severance. So uh, subject to any other questions, and, and we're going to have an open question period at the end as well. I'll hand it over to Chris and he can talk about um, force majeure clauses specifically. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Um, there was one other question there that I don't think Justin touched on. It's really more relevant to what I'm going to talk about today. And that's, if I put it, and I assume that means a force majeure con uh, clause in a contract, which I'm preparing now, will it apply to COVID-19? Um, and I'll touch on that while I'm talking about force majeure clauses more generally. Um, so as Justin's perspective is more, the contract's been drafted the two parties are you know, fulfilling their terms of the contract. And at some point during the course of this, COVID-19 happens, uh, you know, a fire happens, a flood, an earthquake, some sort of act of God um, is the term of art often used, comes into play and stops the part, one of the parties from being able to fill their terms of the contract. My perspective is party comes to me and they want me to prepare a contract um, for an eventual relationship between them and another party. So, when you're dealing with Justin, you're stuck with what you have and you either can rely on the contract as it was drafted or take a bit more difficult approach and go for frustration of contract, which like Justin said, is fairly difficult and a high threshold to reach. The nice part about thinking about this in advance is that force majeure contracts, you can lower that threshold by crafting them in a way that they deal with issues that may affect you as a business owner and you can set out very clearly in the contract, if this occurs and it has this effect on me, this is what's going to happen to this contract. And whether that's we delay performance until it's over or we walk away, it can be anywhere from you know, a very minor remedy of just extending timelines for shipments to saying the contract's at an end, we can't continue this relationship anymore. So there's three main elements to a force majeure contract and the first one is what is the triggering event? The second is what is the effect of that triggering event on a party? So just because if COVID-19 is the triggering event, if a national pandemic is the triggering event, that in and of itself is not enough to activate the force majeure clause. It must actually have a certain effect on the party. And finally, how does that effect on the party impact the obligations under the contract? So that's really where a well-drafted force majeure clause can help you in avoiding fighting through the courts and just simply saying, this is the answer. We've already agreed on this and this is how we'll be proceeding. So I know Justin touched on the fact that these really aren't very common um, for small businesses in Ontario. We often include them in agreements, um, but they'll you know, often be treated as a bit of boilerplate, a clause to be added in with the more generic um, acts of God included. So things like natural disasters, you know, military wars, revolutions, terrorism, a change in laws in the province, uh, organized labor activity like a strike or an epidemic or quarantines um, that are put in place by the government. So there's often not much thought put into this, but in order to draft one of these contracts well, and I think um, post COVID-19, it's gonna be a lot more common that people are thinking about this um, because Ontario really doesn't experience many of these things. We're not in a fault line. We don't have hurricanes. We don't have many floods um, other than some you know, up in Muskoka. I know there's lots of flooding, but it's not something 
that happens all the time. There's not wars, you know, there hasn't been a war in Canada for hundreds of years. But um, things like strikes, quarantines, we see now that those can happen here. And I think a lot more attention is going to be turned to them moving forward. Um, so as a business owner, you really want to think what would affect you um, in particular. So say you have a factory and it's near you know, a river that's prone to flooding. It may have never hit your business, but you may want to make sure that you know, that's specifically dealt with. What happens if that river floods and it floods your factory? Um, or if you have unionized employees, you know, a strike might want to be specifically set out there because that is something that could happen. And as we've all seen, um, epidemics and quarantines may also be something that we want to deal with. Hopefully it doesn't happen again in our lifetimes, but you know, it could happen. Um, and that's where I want to touch on the previous question about, um, the, if you enter into the now, will COVID-19, you know, take part in that? It's hard to say because it's a known event at this time. Um, it's hard to say that there will be no, you know, if if things stay as they are with COVID-19, it's difficult to argue that that's a force majeure event. If you're just entering into that contract now, if things progress in an unexpected way and, and businesses are impacted in new ways that weren't in existence at the time of the contract, it likely could be argued that that, that is a new force majeure event and it'll trigger the force majeure clause. Um, and speaking of force majeure, there's a question here asking, do the clauses need to use the term force majeure? There, it's often used. Um, there's no real necessity of that term. It's, it's a legal term of art. It you know, describes a somewhat convoluted idea very briefly. But I think as long as the clause sets out a triggering event, what the impact has to be on the party who's claiming um, the force majeure or whatever you want to call it in this case and what the effect is on the contract uh, it's just the contractual provision like any other and it can be whatever the parties agree to so once you've determined what trigger events there are just because a trigger event occurs doesn't necessarily mean there's an impact on one of the two parties that you know makes the contract more difficult to perform or impossible to perform just because there's you know an earthquake doesn't mean that your particular business is infected impact in any way. And just because COVID-19 is in place doesn't mean that any particular business is affected by it. Everyone's affected by it to an extent, but not necessarily to the extent that um, would trigger a force majeure clause. Like Justin said, if you have a contract for buying tomatoes and you can still sell food, you still have to honor that. Um, even if pandemic is set out in your force majeure clause, it doesn't necessarily, um, unless you've set out very clear provisions for you know, if a pandemic and if demand for products goes down, we can, you know, delay our orders, we can cancel this order. So you can always craft things however the other party will agree to. But if it's a more general clause, um, you need to make sure that the trigger event actually impacts the party. Um, and you want to set out in the clause what that impact is. So if it is just the loss in revenue of X percent, then if you can put that in there and that's something um, businesses might, might want to consider and that way you can rely on these clauses, even if it falls far below um, a more basic force majeure clause or frustration, if it wouldn't hit that threshold that the courts are looking for. And so once you've determined what the triggering event is and what the effect is on the party, you then wanna see what's the effect on the contract. So if COVID-19 has decreased revenues by X percent, then what happens in that scenario? And it can either be this contract's terminated, um, you know, our orders go down by a proportionate percentage with demand so that your business isn't spending too much money on tomatoes that there's no demand for. And this is where, you know, you can be as simplistic or as complicated as you want. You can make this um, incredibly in depth and have all these different contingencies. And as long as both parties agree, that'll be in, in effect. Um, or you can keep it very simple and just say, you know, all obligations are suspended until the end of the force majeure event. Um, there's a question here. What do I do if my contract doesn't have a force majeure clause and COVID-19 has shut down my operations? So that really touches on what Justin said. Um, so for your agreements, if 
if you aren't able to fulfill it, you can always argue frustration. But like Justin said, um, force majeure doesn't exist outside of a contractual obligation. So the, the force majeure is gone if it's not in your contracts and you'd have to rely on the doctrine of frustration. Um, and that's really the only recourse. Um, you can always, going to court isn't always the only option as much as the litigator might tell you it is. You can always try to negotiate with suppliers and um, you know, consumers of your product and try to come to an agreement, you know, that's mutually acceptable to both of you because, you know, burning bridges is not always the best option going to litigation. And you know, often other parties will be accommodating to a certain extent. Um, and there's another question here. What if the other party does not agree that the force majeure clause applies? And I think this is probably more for Justin. So I don't know if you want to hop in here, Justin. Yeah, sure. So, um, <clears throat> like Chris said, uh, the force majeure clause, can be as uh, specific or as broad as you'd like it to be. And of course, when it's more broad, that can lead to uncertainty and can lead to disagreements. Um, for example, um, you could have a force majeure clause that said something along the lines of um, um, a disease. Um, and then perhaps the parties disagree whether or not COVID-19, you know, works within that definition. I mean, I think it's pretty clear what the answer is, but I'm just providing an example here of where two parties could disagree about the terms and what happens there is ideally, like Chris says, negotiation, and perhaps you come to some middle ground about performance, um, perhaps some suspension of obligation or change in price or something along those lines. Um, but eventually, if, if you cannot come to an agreement as to how to interpret the, the clause that you've drafted, you'd have to go to court, you'd have to litigate, you'd have to sue. And um, the one thing to remember, um, which is just a general principle of con contract interpretation, is that the terms of the contract are drafted or sorry, are interpreted um, in favor, or I should say against um, the, uh, the drafting party. So um, if I am the person who drafted the contract and had the other person sign it, then if there's some ambi ambiguity, it's gonna be interpreted against me. Chris, did you want to continue? I can answer some of these other questions. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on really one more key point with drafting. Um, and that's that, so even if you have a clause that touches on, say it has pandemic in there as your force, as a triggering event, and your revenues have gone down, the link between the triggering event and the effect on the party also has to be quantified in some way. Um, just because demand's gone down, it doesn't necessarily mean, um, or just because a pandemic's occurred and demand's gone down, unless you draft the clause very specifically to capture that, the effect on your business needs to be directly attributable to whatever that triggering event is. So say in Justin's example about the tomato purchase, if someone's drafted a, a more simplistic clause that says, you know, pandemic is a triggering event, and if a pandemic occurs, I can suspend all obligations um, as long as it affects me. That would only apply in that case if the pandemic directly affects that business in some way, either through you know, an outbreak in the restaurant that the government then says, okay, your restaurant shut down, you're a hotspot for COVID-19, or in the event of a mandated shutdown by the government, a blanket shutdown on all restaurants. If it simply results in a lower demand for your product and, you know, cash flows that aren't up to the standards that will allow you to pay your lease or buy your tomatoes, that's not quite enough, um, unless the contract's been specifically drafted in that way to allow for that. Um, so indirect effects, so you know, if, there, if the pandemic's in place and if no one's buying, going out to restaurants and you're still open, that, that isn't good enough, unless the contract specifically deals with that. And it's more of a termination remedy at that point than a true force majeure. So, we can deal with anything you want when drafting, 
but it's just to be careful to look at using this as an out when the effect isn't direct be tied with the triggering events. And that's really what I wanted to, to end on for my part is that we can draft whatever you want as long as the parties agree, but you really need to make sure that um, be careful when you're drafting to make sure what you want and what's in there really correspond. And, and just because a pandemic's a triggering event doesn't mean you'll get the result you want um, with a force injury clause. So I can answer, see if there's a couple more questions. Um, <clears throat> can you give me examples for the service and hospitality industry or short-term rentals rather than purchasing items where the government has placed limits on the number of people that can gather? Okay, so uh, it sounds like you're asking, that there's a lot of different aspects to this question, I think. so. Number one, I would just say, first of all, Ontario has banned, temporarily banned short-term rentals uh, that I, I don't think they lifted that ban yet. So um, theoretically, that to me um, makes, so, so if you had previously rented out a um, unit to somebody for a weekend, and now the Ontario government has said this is illegal, um, that depending on the terms of your contract with, and the short-term rental, you, you'd have a, a great argument that it's been frustrated. You cannot perform. Um, it's impossible for you to perform without uh, breaking the law. Um, so that would be an example of where frustration may apply uh, in the sh service and hospitality industry. I'm not sure if that was the angle you were looking for, but hopefully it was. Um, here's another one. What if we cannot agree on what qualifies as a pandemic? Um, again, like this is a, this is something that you ideally, or you, you can negotiate and work out, but if you can't, you have to litigate it. And then what ends up happening is, um, people get a scientist to come into court and, um, provide expert evidence as to what exactly is a pandemic. And if COVID-19, for example, qualifies. So I think most of the scientists would, of course, say, yes, COVID-19 is, is a pandemic. But hey, maybe somebody finds that one scientist who says otherwise, and they'll come into court and give their expert opinion. And I think generally when you're interpreting a contract, you just look to the plain meaning of the words um, if it's not specifically defined. And I think the World Health Organization declaring something a pandemic is just on its own good enough evidence that, that it is a pandemic, and I'm sure Justin would have a better idea, but that could probably be brought in um, in support. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, that one's pretty straightforward. Like if you, COVID-19 is, is a pandemic for sure, but uh, I just sort of illustrate it as, as um, a bit of humor because you can get folks coming into court that will say almost anything. So it does happen. Um, what okay we'll answer this one would a pandemic still frustrate a contract in the future now that we've experienced COVID-19 um so this is an interesting question right because as I had said earlier um frustration of contract requires the event um or circumstances to be unforeseeable and arguably now um with COVID-19 having occurred, uh, you know, and ideally we get a vaccine in a year or two and, and we never think about this ever again, but um, legitimately like three years from now, let's say that that were to occur, um, arguably at this point in time, everybody's aware that a pandemic is a possibility. And so I would argue that in the future, it might be more difficult to argue frustration of contract, at least for the next 25, 30 years, um, based on uh, a pandemic, because the court would say, well, this happened and, and you should have taken that into account, right? So uh, when, you were, when you were contracting with this party. Um, so it, this will actually make it much more difficult to argue frustration based on a pandemic moving forward. Uh, but again, 
that's why you would put you would have Chris draft a nice force majeure clause and stipulate that a pandemic would allow you to suspend performance or, or whatever you like. So I, I, I'm happy to answer like the employment law questions in a bit. I think we'll just wait a bit. Um, if anyone has more questions about uh, force majeure specifically and frustration of contract, uh, we should get to those questions first, just because that's the topic of our presentation today. Um, and there's one question here that was just sent. Um, it's not in the Q&A, but the question was, I think I might need some clarification on the question. Um, it says, from a contractual obligation of a franchisee who has no clear recourse from force majeure, as outlined here, is there any recourse the franchisee who cannot produce the minimum requirements of the contract that are being enforced by the franchisor as a result of COVID-19. Um, One second. I'm so I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if the question there is saying that there isn't a written contract or if it just, the events um, don't meet the force majeure set out in the contract. Okay, so I think that what they're saying here is they're saying they don't have a force majeure clause, so they can't rely on that. And then they're saying, um, they're a franchisee, so maybe they own a Subway and, and Subway says you need to sell 100 subs a month, otherwise, you know, I don't know, whatever the consequences are. I think that's what they're suggesting. And what can they do about that? Um, again, I mean, in, in this situation, like without just on the, on the bare facts, like which are obviously very limited, um, there, you're not going to have a lot of options there. Um, you're not, if you don't have a force majeure clause that you can take advantage of, then you can't take advantage of it. Um, and if you don't have a, you're not going to have a fran uh, frustration argument there because Subway can still sell subs. It's not impossible to sell a sub right now. Unfortunately, you couldn't, you wouldn't be successful arguing that. Um, so, I mean, really what, to me, in that kind of a situation, a franchise a franchise, like, for example, I'm just saying Subway, like, as a example, I, I don't imagine that they're going to want, you know, half their stores to shut down, because people aren't meeting the 100 sub limit. Um, so, in a sense, like, th this is why parties come together and find a solution, right? Because Subway does, Subway relies on presence and all their communities, right? And so they don't, they understand a, a franchisee would have difficulty and and um, and then they can work out an agreement to ensure that everybody's happy. Okay, so yeah, there are some employment law questions and yeah, I don't practice, but I think Justin's a lot better suited to deal with these. Okay, so let's talk about some employment law questions. Um, let's start with Susan. Thanks for waiting, Susan. I hope you're still here. I know I, I, I delayed the answer to this question until the end. So here we go. When a job is offered and all the health and safety protocols are taken and employees refuse to come back without any justifiable reason, what can an employer do? What are our options? Well, uh, they quit. You cannot, that, that to me is abandoning um, their position. That's, that's them quitting. Uh, you can't force somebody to come into work. Um, so uh, you need to put out an ad for new employees and hire somebody else. I'm sorry, that's the tough, tough answer to the question, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you can't for, there's no such thing as forced labor, right? We can't force somebody to, uh, to come into work, if they want to quit, then they're free to do that. I mean, certain situations, uh, employers can sue employees for not performing. Uh, but I mean, it, it's more so in the context of um, high level employees or, uh, you know, um, for somebody with like a, a significant level of knowledge or a specific skill that's highly valued um, and, and, a, and a very specific employment contract um, that an employer could take action against an employee for lost income. But that, that's 
few and far between. If you're talking about general, you know, minimum wage type work, um, you, you're not going to have any success uh, attempting to uh, take action against the former employee. Um, okay. If a business was closed by government order, will you be obligated to pay as per ESA? So I think what this is asking is, are you required to pay termination pay when your business is closed by government order? And I would say the answer is yes. So in most circumstances. So if you have employment contracts with your employees that allows for you to temporarily lay them off, then when your business was closed by government order, then you can temporarily lay uh, the employees off. And um, a temporary layoff uh, can only last for so long until it becomes a termination. And um, <clears throat> when it becomes a termination, you will have to pay uh, ESA severance and potentially common law, uh, or sorry, I should say ESA notice and potentially severance um, and also potentially uh, notice pursuant to the common law. Um, if you do not have employment contracts that allow you to temp temporarily lay off employees, then technically an employee uh, can assert that they have been terminated um, when you closed uh, the doors. And if, um, if uh, they choose to do so, then yes, absolutely. You're gonna owe um, termination pay pursuant to the Employment Standards Act in general, I, I would say, of course, again, every situation is different. And as lawyers, we, we can never provide legal advice just as a blanket statement. Um, but in general, I would say that, yes, uh, uh, you'd, you'd be obligated to pay uh, termination pay under the Employment Standards Act. Okay. <clears throat> Mackenzie, I think has a, oh, we answered that one. Okay, Mackenzie, I think we answered your question. Looks like you said yes, okay. Uh, let me know if there's any other questions out there. I don't think we have any more questions coming in. I think that's about it for now. Um, just wanted to thank you guys. Do you guys have any last words before we wrap it up? Thanks for coming out, everybody. Hope you're yeah, doing all the times. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, we really appreciate your time for answering all the questions today. And we're really grateful for everyone else who joined in. We've really enjoyed the format for Thirsty Thursday um, and that they have brought us for the month of April. So kind of an exciting announcement that you guys get to know here first. We're going to be rolling out a program over the next few weeks that features experts in residence. So of course, this is going to be vir virtual and not in the sandbox residence yet, but um, this involves mentors over uh, various topics. So um, we also have Barristan back as our legal experts in residence the first Thursday of every month. So starting May 7th, they'll be back for an hour to talk employment law and company health benefits as it relates to COVID-19. So stay connected with us via social at Sandbox Center and our website, sandboxcenter.com. You can subscribe to our newsletter there to get all the updates with who our experts are going to be and when they're going to be in the residence and how they can support you. So that's all we have for today. Thanks again for joining and have a great rest of your week, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye now.